Hello again, this is Janet Simmons, and in this video, we will continue to examine workplace learning ROI and gain an understanding of how success is measured. We will begin with two analysis questions, and then we'll look at three reasons for measuring success and ROI. Next, we'll take a brief look at Kirkpatrick's model of training evaluation. And then we'll examine Philip's ROI methodology. And we'll wrap up the video with measuring success and ROI before looking at a synthesis activity that you will include in your PBL assignment. I'm sure this has happened to everyone at some point. You've made an investment of some sort, and it doesn't necessarily have to be financial. It could be an investment of your time or perhaps a purchase of an expensive product. How would you feel if you didn't get a return on your investment? While the response is important, it's also important to learn from these types of mistakes. What would you do differently if the same opportunity arose? And why do you think it's important to learn from these types of situations? Every organization that undertakes training must evaluate it. There are a number of reasons for this, such as justifying training and development budgets and investments. Training is often conducted to teach learners how to do a task, so, determining training effectiveness is also important. As we discovered earlier, there are different types of training, such as formal and apprenticeships. Therefore, evaluating the training method or methods used should also be evaluated. While we haven't discussed it in depth, you should keep in mind that this would also include the delivery methods and instructional design. Training evaluation should also include changes in time, cost, and or behavior. Evaluations are conducted to also identify the strengths and potential weaknesses of the training program, and of course to determine if the training is appropriate. Training costs time and resources. Therefore, training programs are evaluated to provide evidence to stakeholders and management. This, of course, will also gain credibility with executives and will assist with the decision-making for program investments and funding priorities. In turn, evaluations also support marketing of training and human resources development programs. Finally, return on investment training evaluations build trust for training throughout the organization. Donald Kirkpatrick created one of the most famous tools for training evaluations. Kirkpatrick's ideas and approaches are also considered the gold standard for training evaluation. For our purposes, we will examine Kirkpatrick's four levels of evaluation. These are reaction, learning, behavior, and results. The first level is reaction. This level focuses on the training participant's reaction to training. This should be thought of as a participant's satisfaction with the overall training experience. This type of satisfaction evaluation is considered lower level, as it does not dig into the learning experience. Nonetheless, reaction of participants is important to record, as it often is used to evaluate the training design, the instructor, exercises, relevance of the information presented, and perhaps the facilities where the training took place. The second level is learning. This level measures what participants actually learned compared to what they were supposed to learn. This is best measured against the learning objectives. This typically measures the increase of knowledge obtained through the training program. To accurately measure this, benchmark data should be gathered for comparison purposes. This tends to be fairly easy when the knowledge can be quantified or if technical skills are measured. Such information is gathered through interviews or observations of before and after attending training. The third level is behavior. This level ascertains whether participants actually change their behavior after completing the training. Participants may have learnt the new information, but it is equally important to see if they are applying the new knowledge. If they aren't applying the knowledge, then it's equally important to discover why this is occurring. There may be hindrances in the workplace that are preventing the change in behavior. Nonetheless, measuring the changes in behavior should occur directly after training and then again sometime after the training is complete. This will indicate if participants have adopted, rejected, modified, 
or discontinued applying their new knowledge. In Kirkpatrick's model, the highest level of valuation is results. The results are measured against the outcomes originally stated in the training program. Think of this evaluation as understanding the effect on the business or environment. Quantifiable business indicators are often used for this and may include staff turnover, wastage, growth of sales volume, and return on investment. The challenge is to identify how the training and the participants influence these numbers. It's fairly easy to measure an individual's sales volume, but equating the results to training across an organization is challenging, particularly as there may be external factors that affect the business, and a variety of roles and responsibilities of all employees complicate the understanding of the effect of training. Phillips' ROI methodology is similar to the Kirkpatrick model, but Kirkpatrick includes ROI in the results level whereas Jack Phillips believed ROI should be in its own level. This is the fifth level. As we discovered in the previous video, the ROI compares the program benefits to the cost and answers the question, will we make money? The methodology goes beyond Kirkpatrick's model, as Phillips' ROI methodology has comprehensive 10-step process, similar to the planning discussed in the previous video. Steps 6 through 9 are important to us. Step 6 converts the data collected to a monetary value. Step 7 indicates intangible benefits, such as the increase in morale. Step 8 captures the cost of the training solution. The ninth step calculates the ROI. When the ROI is calculated, the costs are compared to the benefits that are converted to a monetary value. According to Barnett and Maddox, today's approach to measuring success in corporate training is a complex mix of theory and practice and trial and error, with key contributions derived from evaluation theory, instructional design, technology, statistics, and basic business processes. Even more intriguing is how the interaction of business training and technology continuously alters the way in which training is delivered and, in turn, influences its evaluation. So what exactly does this mean? For some organizations, it means merely having enough data to meet compliance regulations. More robustly, others wish to determine the quality of courses across their curriculum, culling those that appear less effective. Still, others try to estimate the ROI of various learning methodologies, while yet another group creates real-time dashboards to track the amount, quality, and cost of training across business units. Perceptions of success vary by organization and even within organizations, as do methods of evaluation. As I mentioned at the beginning of the video, we have synthesis activities this week. Start thinking about ROI and how it affects the scenario in your PBL. You need to demonstrate how your group will determine ROI. Next, I want you to create a high-level ROI. How will you evaluate and measure the ROI? High-level plans do not have an abundance of detail, but do provide sufficient details to be an outline that can be easily followed. ROI must be the ultimate measure of evaluation from a business and corporate perspective and for any activity within a firm. To be sustainable, it must be measurable. The main payoff of the ROI methodology is that it allows the justification and defense of budgets for workplace training and learning programs.